Well, thank you, Susan, and thank you all for being here. Can people in the back hear me okay if I talk about this? It's not too loud, though. Okay, we're good. Um, thanks. It's been great chatting with people today and uh, talking about things that are going on here and some of my research. Uh, and like Susan said, I am in the geography department now, but I come from an ecology background, so uh, I am one of you. Um, and my title is very broad. I'm going to talk about uh, why plants grow, where, and when they grow. So we're talking about space and we're talking about time. And then I added this little flag that it, we're going to be talking mostly about remote sensing. Even though my background is in ecology, most of what I do involves uh, looking at the land surface. Ooh, uh, we can, is there like a middle ground option? Um, I mean, I can do it in the dark, but people will probably fall asleep. Uh, I think it should be fine. Most of the slides are pretty visible. Uh, anyway, so um, most of my work has been remote sensing, looking uh, at the land surface from above. And I'll talk a little bit about, for those of you who don't know anything about remote sensing, I'll talk a little bit about how it actually works in a few minutes. Um, to give you a sense of what I'm really talking about, it's landscapes like this, or like any landscape, where we have this mixture of vegetation types. This is actually Santa Cruz Island, uh, off the coast of Southern California, where you can see clearly there are spatial patterns in the vegetation. This picture was also taken by me in August, and so you can see a lot of the herbaceous vegetation is really brown. Uh, it would be green at, uh, during the rainy season. Um, but you can see that there are patterns. You, uh, if you spend time anywhere, you know that there are patterns in time as well as in space. Uh, and the question that I especially was interested in uh, when I was first starting my uh, academic path was what can we say about these spatial patterns? And it's still a question that I think about a lot because um, I think there are some dominant paradigms that we use when we think about how uh, plants organize themselves in space, and they do or don't work depending on where you look. Uh, so the two big questions that I will be talking about today, slightly smaller than my title, but still big questions, is why do plants grow differently in different places? So a question about plant quality. Uh, and then why do plants grow differently at different times? And again, it's that temporal component. And for me, what I'm really interested in more um, generally is can we actually model these patterns? Not just can we identify them, because that's pretty straightforward, but can we, uh, can we model these patterns? And what can we do with remote sensing to understand the patterns that we see? How can we use this tool? I'm sometimes a person who's kind of a, uh, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail sort of scenario. I can probably come up with a remote sensing angle to any ecological question. Um, but I think it's a really useful tool that is just beginning to be really embraced by eco ecologists. Uh, but to start off talking about local scale vegetation variation and patterns, uh, I like to start off with a little bit of a story. It's a little goofy, but if you'll all bear with me and just for a few minutes, imagine that you're a seed. Uh, and to make it interesting, you're not just any seed, but you are an acorn uh, on an oak tree in, say, a northeastern forest or a northern forest. Uh, and you have a bunch of brothers and sisters, and at some point they will all fall to the ground, and they'll roll maybe a few feet away from you, uh, from your oak tree, from your parent tree, but you, uh, you are lucky uh, and they'll mostly get eaten, you're lucky, and you get picked up by a blue jay. And you get transported some great distance. And so for a plant, this is already pretty exceptional. You've already moved way further than the average seed ever gets to move. Um, and you've landed in a spot that just so happens to not have another uh, plant growing there, so you don't have to worry about competition. Um, maybe a cow ate that, the plant that was there before. Uh, maybe there was a fire that created some open habitat. But you have an open spot to grow in. Uh, you also happen to have landed uh, somewhere where the soil works for you, so uh, all of the soil properties uh, are appropriate for you to grow and thrive. Um, you've landed somewhere where you get enough sunshine, but not too much, you don't dry out. Uh, and you happen to have done all of these things in, uh, in a year where it's wet enough for you to take root. Uh, in places like Michigan, we don't really worry about interannual variability in rainfall too much, um, but in other parts of the world, there can be quite a bit, so some years maybe nothing germinates. Uh, and so you eventually take root, you grow, uh, and you become your own organism, and you produce seeds, and you uh, repeat the cycle, and the process repeats itself. And that's, uh, even though that's a very simple story about how plants work in landscapes, it covers a lot of what we understand to be important about this question of what determines where plants grow. Uh, we sort of talked about fecundity, about this, oh, sorry, about this idea that uh, different plants will produce different amounts of seeds, and that could, over long periods of time, affect your relative distribution of species. Uh, we talked about dispersal. Dispersal is hugely important in determining who actually gets where on a landscape. Uh, and we talked a little bit about environmental filtering, about this idea that 
there are certain environmental conditions, the amount of sunshine, the amount of, or the type of soil and the amount of rain that affect whether or not you can succeed. Uh, we talked about disturbance. Disturbance is, can be a really critical part of different ecosystems. Um, fire, animals, uh, floods, storms, all sorts of things uh, create new habitat. Uh, we talked a little bit about interactions or the lack thereof in my story, but plants interact with other plants, right? They have competition, they can have commensal relationships, etc. Um, and last but not least, I didn't really talk about this, but there are feedbacks, right? Plants are not passengers in their ecosystems. They can actually affect the biogeochemical cycling, they can affect the fire cycle, and they can affect, uh, they can even affect the climate, and we'll get to that at the very end of the talk. Um, and these ideas uh, are not new. Clements actually summarized this work. Clements was a Carnegie person, which is where I did my dissertation, so I'm contractually obligated to bring him up whenever I talk about ecology. Um, but Clements summarized these ideas in 1916. And, uh, and since then, I think there's been lots and lots of great work focusing in on each of these ideas. But if we want to do something like predict where plants are going to end up in the future, uh, we need to remember that they're all happening. And I will uh, fully admit that my bias is always towards environmental filtering. A lot of people's is, especially at the sort of Earth system scale, we tend to focus on uh, environmental filtering, on the environmental conditions that drive the patterns we see. But as I'll talk about today, uh, that's usually only one component of the processes we need to consider if we want to actually predict where plants are going to move in the future. Uh, and so, I realize I should keep track of time. Um, so for this first, first question, we're also going to go across a couple different scales. So we're going to talk about local work um, at really fine scales, which is fun and interesting for its own idiosyncratic reasons. But then we'll also, towards the end of the talk, when we talk about uh, temporal variation, we're going to go global because why not? Uh, but for this first part, I'm going to talk mostly about work that I did uh, in my dissertation, which is now getting a little bit old, um, but is still interesting, working with a Carnegie Airborne Observatory. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's uh, basically an airplane with a couple sensors inside of it. Uh, and the two sensors that are important uh, to my research are uh, a LIDAR sensor. LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging. And uh, all that means is that the plane shoots a beam of light, measures how long it takes to come back, and gives you this uh, measure of forest structure. So here you can see uh, a field down here, not any forest structure, uh, and then a forest up in the top. And you can't see topography in this image, but it also gives you really high resolution topographic data, which I used for my work quite a bit. Uh, the, more, the part that I'm more interested in now uh, is this idea of hyperspectral imaging. And I realize we're not uh, in a remote sensing group, and so I'm going to try to explain what this actually looks like. So uh, if you take a picture with your camera, with your phone, what that picture actually is is a layer of three images in red, green, and blue. And the camera combines those three colors into uh, an image you see like this one, so a true color image. Uh, red, green, and blue are just uh, wavelengths along a much broader spectrum. Uh, and so it turns out that plants, um, plants not only reflect light in the visible, but they reflect light in the infrared as well. And so unlike your, the, we would call it a three-band camera in your phone, uh, a hyperspectral sensor or the uh, field of imaging spectroscopy uses uh, use about 200 bands from the visible out into the infrared. So that one's a little hard to see, but uh, I think you get the gist. Um, so these are three, this is data from three, so sorry, four pixels pulled out of this image. Uh, and well, the one thing to remember if you forgot your high school physics is that, or college physics for some people here, um, the visible spectrum is only from about 400 to 700 nanometers. So we can only see this stuff. Um, and so this is a tree, this green, spectrum uh, right here. And you can see there is a peak in the middle, which is where the green is, which is why we see green, because plants reflect green light. Um, and I'm not going to belabor this. I'm a little obsessed with it because I've been teaching right now. But uh, the uh, big thing to notice is that uh, there's this really extreme jump in the green vegetation that we don't see in the dry grass, the yellow. We don't see it in the gray gravel. And we, don't, we definitely don't see it in the water. Water is almost black. Uh, and it turns out plants reflect light a whole bunch in the near infrared and they reflect light a lot more differently. And so we can rely on that data, even though we can't see it with our eyes, we can use it through uh, special cameras and also uh, analytical tools to understand differences in plants that we can't see with the naked eye. So if we take an image, uh, we'll go back for a second. If we take this green image and then we go forward, this is what the same image looks like when we're looking uh, in the infrared. So now everything red in this image is stuff that's bright 
in the infrared. And we won't go through it in detail, but I promise that uh, there's a lot more variation in the infrared among the vegetation types uh, than there is uh, in the visible. And it turns out that allows us to do things like map uh, plant traits, plant uh, foliar chemistry. We can use the LIDAR data to map above ground biomass, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, uh, and lots of people are trying to figure out all the different ways we can use these types of data. Uh, so what I wanted to do, one of the first uh, projects that I worked on was trying to understand, um, and actually sort of generally what I'm interested in is, okay, we have this really high resolution spatial data. We can see that there's lots of variation, especially in a place like uh, Jasper Ridge, which is in California. Um, how much of that variation can we explain using the environmental gradients that we also have spatial data about? So. Uh, at Jasper Ridge, that meant um, I wanted to look at mapping things like above ground biomass and also uh, leaf uh, nitrogen and carbon and water. Uh, I'm also I'm just going to briefly touch on other projects where we've done the same idea, trying to associate NDVI, which you don't need to know what that is. If you don't, it's just a measure of plant greenness from remote sensing and look how that varies uh, across, um, across the landscape, Santa Cruz Island. Uh, on the Osa Peninsula, I worked on a project looking essentially using the same approach, but looking at above ground carbon uh, that Phil Taylor led. Uh, and then on Barrow, Colorado Island, again, we looked at above ground carbon. And all of these studies were looking at different patterns, uh, but generally the idea is how much of that variation can we explain using readily available spatial data? So stuff that, stuff that we can figure out, not stuff that we have to either kind of make up or, um, or do too much derivation to get. Uh, so what that meant is I built a statistical model using topographic data, so elevation, slope, aspect. There's a bunch of other uh, ways you can quantify the kind of wrinkliness or lack thereof in a landscape. Uh, I looked at geology. There's, uh, we have good geology data for most of these sites. I looked a little bit at hydrology, so how far away is water. Um, we can do some sort of coarse calculations of soil wetness. Uh, and for the places where we had the data, I also incorporated uh, historical land use, which essentially is just some idea of um, how the landscapes might have been divided up uh, across, across space. And so I'm just going to focus in on one of these studies at Jasper Ridge because um, I think it's the most easy to follow. Some of these get a little esoteric, but this one I like to think is pretty straightforward, uh, and I think I have the best figures for it. So um, at Jasper Ridge, you already saw it, but it's basically this is a a ridge along here that's covered in grass. Uh, and then there's uh, evergreen forest around here, um, still broadleaf evergreen, and there's chaparral, uh, and there's a wetland down here. So even though it's really small, it's about 490 hectares, it has essentially almost all of the vegetation types you might expect to find in kind of central Northern California. And so I spent uh, about two years in the field collecting field data to do allometric um, um, estimations of above ground biomass. And I don't talk anything about the methods because everybody who knows how to do that knows how to do it. Um, and if you don't, you can just assume I did, through magic, generate this map of measured above ground biomass at Jasper Ridge. So really high biomass. This is a uh, redwood stand. Um, and you can see, essentially, there's a broad range of above ground biomass values across the site. This was using that LIDAR data associated with uh, field measurements. And then I built a statistical model to try to then predict this pattern using environmental gradient data. So uh, what I had to work with, among other things, were things like topographic data, which we had from the LIDAR. Uh, we can calculate things from that, like summer insulation, because we know where we are on the planet and we know the topography. Um, we had, fortunately, really ge uh, good geologic data. I didn't use soils data for this project, because soils, are, uh, soils maps are typically derived from veg maps. And so it would have been a little circular. And I had this little bit of information for Jasper Ridge about uh, what it was like before Stanford bought it. So it was bought by Stanford in the 1890s, and all we more or less know about it is that this was, these were the dividing lines of the parcels before it was bought. So you could imagine that people might have done, uh, had different sort of management strategies or different land use on these different parcels. Uh, and then there's one fun aspect of this that we have to incorporate, which is spatial autocorrelation. So whenever you do um, any sort of research that exists on a landscape, you should incorporate the fact that your, uh, your samples are not independent of each other, right? Um, so if you were going to sample this hillside, and uh, so you had your plots spread out across it, um, all other things being equal, you might find that plots that were more close to one another were similar just because they're closer to one another, right? They're not independent samples like we really want in a statistical framework. 
So fortunately, there's lots of great ways of dealing with this. The one that I used is called simultaneous autoregressive modeling. Uh, there's a bunch of references if you're really interested in it. What you need to know, or what uh, was emotionally trying for me is that it takes a really long time to do on these huge data sets. Um, but the ultimate result of this project was a map that looks like this. So this is my predictive model of above ground biomass for Jasper Ridge. Uh, and we can compare it to the model, uh, sorry, to the, what I, we measured from LIDAR. Um, and we can look, flip back and forth and be like, oh, it actually looks kind of good. It doesn't look terrible. It's not that bad. Uh, and so because this is a regression type model, we can ask how much of this variation can we actually explain? Uh, and, uh, and the answer for Jasper Ridge, um, looking at above ground biomass at 25 meter resolution is we actually, not including the spatial autocorrelation, which I left out for a reason, can only explain about 44% uh, of that variation in biomass using all of those variables. So other stuff is going on. Um, so, uh, and like I said, I did this project, or this type of approach, or we did these types of analyses in a bunch of other sites. And so uh, on Santa Cruz Island, it turned out that at 25 meter resolution, we could only explain between eight and 25% of the variation using all of that data in NDVI, another vegetation measurement. Uh, when we looked at Jasper Ridge uh, chemical, foliar chemical traits, not including, again, spatial autocorrelation, we could explain about a quarter of the variation. Uh, on the Osa Peninsula, we could explain, this is where it gets really complicated, 23% at 30 meter resolution, uh, but lower, 18% uh, at one hectare. In contrast to on BCI, we could explain 33% at one hectare resolution, uh, but only 14% at 30 meters. So these two flip-flopped. I have random ideas as to why that might be. Um, but the kind of overall point of all of this is environmental gradients at this local scale are important, but they're clearly not telling the whole story and explaining these vegetation patterns that we can observe. Uh, and so for Jasper Ridge, for this uh, above ground biomass study, uh, what I actually got interested in was looking not just, not saying, okay, we did a pretty good job, let's write a paper, but uh, what couldn't we explain? And so this is a map of the residuals, they're normalized, so they're not, um, it doesn't look just like a map of the actual landscape. Uh, so basically the point here is that green things and purple things are places where the model did not do well, and beigey things are places where the model did fine. Uh, and what you can see, so you might, one expectation you might have is that you would have high predictions and low predictions kind of clustered, and that's not the case here. You have this mix where basically the model is terrible, it's both high and low consistently in certain parts of the, uh, of the landscape. And so I thought that was interesting uh, from spending a lot of time staring at uh, air photos of Jasper Ridge, I can tell you that these are all uh, grasslands on the edges of grasslands. So they're places where forest and grassland are starting to mix. And that's essentially, we, uh, using this approach, do a terrible job of explaining these savanna type parts of the landscape. So I thought that was fascinating. Thought about different explanations for that. There's a whole bunch. I'm sure you guys can all come up with uh, ones that might work. But at Jasper Ridge, the one that I found to be the most compelling, so we're going to zoom in on this little star right here, is even though so Jasper Ridge was bought by Stanford in the 1890s, and so in my head it was protected since then because now it's this relatively well-known field site, uh, it was actually used for recreation and grazing for quite a big part of the 1900s. So this is an air photo from Google Earth from 1948. Uh, and you can see this, so we've zoomed in, this is the lake, there's the lake. Um, so we're looking just at a part of the landscape, but here you can see, and there's written documentation of this as well, that they actually um, harvested hay on this, uh, this part of the landscape. So even though in my mind we're looking at like a pristine-ish kind of savanna, it's actually a landscape that was heavily modified by people not that long ago in the time scale of uh, plants growing in this type of environment. And so most of these trees, you can look at an air photo from today and all of these trees are still here, but there's just no regeneration coming uh, or very little regeneration coming up around them now, even though they stopped grazing, I think, in the 1970s-ish. Uh, and so that was really the big conclusion of this, was that, like, fine, we can build models to explain things, but it's actually really can be interesting and compelling to look at the part we can't explain and try to understand, if, see if we can infer anything from just looking at that unexplained variation. Uh, so that's kind of the big conclusion of this for me, was that land use at Jasper Ridge appears to be important. Uh, 
In all these other sites, it's kind of comparable. You can come up with explanations as to why this did or did not work. Um, but it's still not that satisfying. And what this, uh, this led me to, and we'll get to in a minute, this interest in longer term temporal patterns and thinking about not just the static snapshots that we can get from airborne remote sensing that's only been around for maybe a decade, um, but what can we learn about uh, how ecosystems work from longer term studies and from models. Uh, if you're really excited about this work, I also um, sort of like a remote sensing evangelist at some point. Um, and uh, one of the problems with airborne remote sensing is it's really hard to get data. And so lots of people are like, oh, I'd love to do that, but I don't have the data. Uh, but lots of you are probably familiar with NEON, the National Ecological Observatory. Uh, and they currently have two, uh, two airplanes that will be collecting almost identical data to this type of data that I've shown today. So a combination hyperspectral uh, and LIDAR system it sort of is working right now. Um, I know people have opinions about NEON, but uh, from my perspective, the fact that they're going to be collecting, uh, they're supposed to fly all of the NEON sites annually and collect this type of data. So soon, lots of people will have the opportunity to work with these types of data. Um, if you can't wait for NEON to sort themselves out, uh, the other place that this data comes from, which I've actually worked with some, is AVARIS, which stands for, uh, it says it right there, I don't even have to remember, Airborne Visible Infrared Imaging Spectrometer. Um, and it uh, has been around for a long time. And you can actually go on the internet uh, to this website at JPL and see all of the places that they've flown around the, mostly almost all in the US. Um, you can see it's kind of fun. So they flew a lot in California because JPL's in Pasadena. Uh, and they did a whole bunch of stuff after the um, Deep Horizon oil spill. So that's what that is all about. Uh, but they also flew, uh, they've flown a little bit in Michigan. I've worked a little bit. That's the Kellogg Biological Station right there. Um, so there's all of this data, and it's essentially supposed to be public. It's not like you can download it, but uh, you can click on any of these lines and find out who the PI was for the project and then contact them, and more than likely they will send it to you. So if you're interested in working with this kind of data, there is data available, although it's geographically limited. Okay, uh, so that's airborne remote sensing. I'm currently doing a couple of projects trying to work in this direction. Um, one of the things I'm interested in is just trying to figure out what we can do with this type of data that's been collected maybe 10 years ago or eight years ago. Um, it exists, people haven't done nearly as much work as they could with these types of data. And so trying to think about what we could do in the absence of having like really great field work associated with it. So just trying to look at spectral variation and what that can tell us about diversity um, without having been able to be on the ground and gone out and done sampling at the same time. Uh, but um, one of the problems with doing uh, airborne remote sensing is that it's almost always these one-off types of studies. We almost always uh, maybe fly a site twice, but typically it's only once. And so we get this perspective that ecosystems, oh, that is dark, um, they kind of look like this. So this is Kanza Prairie, which I'm, uh, I have a little ecology crush on. Uh, but this is what it looks like in the summer. Uh, the NEON program is actually that they're going to fly all of their sites at peak biomass. So we'll have lots more data that looks like this, or maybe you know there might be trees in it. Um, but the truth is that ecosystems actually look like this, right? They change over time. So this is from uh, the Kanza Prairie Phenocam, which is a really awesome network. And these are just monthly slices of that same landscape. And you can see uh, that it changes quite a bit over time, uh, even just the course of a year. Uh, and phenology is. Right, the study of seasonality is not, uh, not restricted to uh, northeastern forests, it's not restricted to prairies, uh, but it's actually a global phenomenon. Um, and it even happens in places like Ethiopia. So this is, uh, this is a great guy who blogged about um, his experience as a Peace Corps volunteer, but he took these really cool pictures of uh, the contrast between the dry season and the wet season uh, in Ethiopia, and you can see Similar to Kanza Prairie, right? You see these really dramatic changes in the landscape that matter, uh, not just ecologically because landscapes change over time, but also to people who are trying to subsist on these landscapes. Um, and so, uh, moving into this question of why plants grow differently at different times, we're also going to do a big scale shift, mostly um, because uh, working in California is great. I love California. California is awesome in all sorts of ways, um, but. Uh, Working in one small part of the world is fun for a little while, but if you really want your work to uh, be extendable beyond your field site, one of the ways to do that is to think about how it fits into a land surface model. Uh, and so we're going to go global. Uh, 
before we start talking about why an ecologist might be interested in land surface models, I'm going to do my quick blurb about uh, what plants actually do, why plants matter to the climate. Some of you may think about this stuff all the time, but some of you may not. Um, so hopefully everybody learned in high school that plants take CO2 out of the air, right? That's why we think they're great. That is an important function of plants. Uh, plants also move water from the soil uh, into the atmosphere at a rate that's faster than evaporation. So they actually suck water out of the ground uh, and pump it into the air. So they can affect um, both uh, cloud formation, rainfall, stuff like that. There's studies that show if you cut down all the trees somewhere, you'll affect the local weather. Um, so that can matter. Uh, plants also, and this is the, the weird one maybe for ecologists, is plants affect the surface uh, albedo of the planet. So albedo is how much light the planet reflects. Um, and plants are really dark. So uh, things like the Sahara are very, very bright. They reflect lots of light, as does snow. Uh, plants are dark. And so that actually means that plants can have a warming effect, uh, sort of net globally, um, depending on where they are and when they're green. Uh, and so this is, is kind of one of the reasons, and I'm sure lots of you uh, have thought about this a lot, that uh, when we think about you know, more plants always being better for the global climate system, that's not necessarily true, because if we get the planet darker, we could actually have a net warming effect. Uh, and plants affect biogeochemical cycling, right? Without, uh, without plants or with different types of plants, we're going to have uh, different biogeochemistry, which can have all sorts of complicated impacts that I don't understand. And last but not least, the one I like to forget, uh, is that plants affect wind or surface roughness. So if you have plants sticking up on the land surface, you'd think it might be kind of minor, but uh, they actually affect the speed at which air moves around the planet. And so that can be significant. Um, so the fact that plants matter to the climate, uh, their sort of their presence or absence is significant. Uh, that also means that phenology matters to the climate because most of these processes don't happen when plants don't have leaves on, right? The wind speed thing is probably not affected that much, but everything else, plants don't take up CO2, they don't move water. Uh, how and when they do their phenology thing uh, affects biogeochemical cycling. Uh, and albedo changes significantly between uh, in, as you can all see, if you look outside right now, we have a very high albedo if the sun ever came out uh, compared to in the uh, summertime when we actually have a lower overall albedo. Uh, and so for this project, um, I'm going to specifically talk about this idea of modeling seasonal changes in vegetation in the semi-arid tropics. Uh, and so I like to go into a little bit of kind of nauseating detail on uh, not too much about how the community land model works, which is the model that I worked with. Um, mostly because I think it's useful for any of you who've ever kind of, whatever you're doing for your research, if you've thought like, oh, maybe this is relevant to kind of land surface modeling, or maybe I'm gonna write in a paper that like, you know, people should care about this process because it matters to land surface models. Uh, it's kind of, I think I found it very instructive to learn how model, these models actually work. Instructive, depressing, it's a little bit of a balance, but um, so hopefully this will be uh, informative to some of you. So uh, the, c the CESM is the Community Earth System Model, which is the model that the National Center for Atmospheric si uh, Research runs. Uh, it is a huge model. I get, once gave one of these talks and somebody afterwards asked me, like, so did you develop this model yourself? I was like, no, there's like 100 people who work full time on running the CESM. Uh, there's about 10 people that work on uh, the CLM, which is the land component of the model. I like this figure. This is just a kind of schematic of how the model actually works functionally. These blobs are sized by how much code is in each part of the model. Um, so CAM, the community atmosphere model, is huge. Uh, CLM is down here, and there's ocean and sea ice and land ice. So there's all these different parts of the model. You can run them so they all interact. So that's what a real Earth system model is, where all we're telling the model is how much sun comes in from the sun, how much solar radiation comes in from the sun, uh, how much CO2 is being created by people, uh, and natural emissions from like volcanoes and stuff like that. And then the model is supposed to do everything else on a 30 minute time step uh, from, uh, from history into the future. Uh, we mostly don't do that because it's really computationally expensive and, uh, and really slow and then you get these results that you totally don't understand. And so for the most part what we do is we run what's called an uncoupled simula simulation or an offline simulation where uh, we drive the land component of the CL or the community land model, which is the land component of this whole system, uh, and we just tell it what the climate is. Um, so we don't allow for these feedbacks between the plants and the atmosphere. So all that stuff I just talked about, we just ignore that. 
Uh, we tell the model what the emissions are, we tell it what a solar radiation is, we tell it how land use changes, we prescribe that because that's extremely difficult to predict. Uh, and then we tell it what the climate is and we try to look at how vegetation changes over short periods or long periods. Other people look at things other than vegetation, but I look at the vegetation part. Uh, and so, so we have this model, it's global, you'll see lots of maps in the next few slides, but um, I was specifically interested in, uh, in phenology and there are uh, for the whole planet, for all plants in the world, there are 15, not including crops, there are 15 plant functional types. So that means like uh, broadleaf deciduous temperate forest is a plant functional type. Um, C4 plants, C4 grasses is a plant functional type, things like that. Uh, of those, so you're like, oh, 15, like you're probably all horrified by that small number, but uh, it's more than some models have. Um, but there are actually only three phenology algorithms, so only three ways that plants can respond Plants can decide whether or not to grow their leaves or not. Uh, so plants can be evergreen. That hopefully is self-explanatory. Uh, uh, plants can be cold deciduous, which is what we have here. They drop their leaves in response to uh, day length mostly, and then they start growing their leaves in response to warm temperatures. Uh, and then we have this third option, this stress or drought deciduous. And this is, um, I think it's the most interesting because it's plants uh, not only responding to things like day length and temperature, but they're also responding to water availability, which is much more variable. Um, and uh, also because I worked in California prior to moving to NCAR, uh, we actually have more drought deciduousness than we do here, for example. Uh, and if it's not a, if you're not familiar with this idea that plants might just like, aside from maybe like the house plant that you kill, um, plants will drop all their leaves before they die uh, in the absence of water, it's not that common in this part of the world. So this is just a map of uh, how much of the land surface is uh, covered by drought deciduous plants in the model. So if you work somewhere and you're like, that's not true in my field site, that's entirely possible that this is wrong for you. Um, but you can see uh, in up in Michigan, which is up there, um, not a whole lot. The only reason there's any is because we classify all non-Arctic C3 grasses as drought deciduous. Um, but you can see it's really dominated by, uh, by the tropics, by the savannas in Africa, by the Cerrado in Brazil, and by Northern Australia. And so those are kind of the places we're gonna focus. But the question that I had about this, um, uh, this process was, uh, does it work at all in the model? Basically nobody works on it, um, nobody had thought about it. Uh, the way that the drought deciduous model worked um, before I started thinking about it, uh, which you'll see in a minute, was based on a 1997 paper uh, exclusively looking at uh, vegetation in North America. And then they just said, well, that's good enough and we'll just use it globally. Um, so I wanted to compare it to a data set and so I compared it to this uh, data set called LAI3G, which is a leaf area index data set starting in, um, it runs from 1982 out to 2010. Uh, and it's mo more or less monthly data, uh, and so I could compare over that long time period uh, monthly variations in LAI. Um, for those of you who do know this kind of stuff and are offended that I'm not going to talk at all about the uncertainty in uh, li uh, the remote sensing world, I'm not going to talk anything about the uncertainty in the remote sensing world. Um, these models are not perfect, but I think you will see, uh, the, sorry, the models, the remote sensing models are not perfect for getting things like leaf area index, but uh, I think they're good enough for trying to get within kind of a reasonable range for these models. And a little bit of foreshadowing, I'm gonna show you a sort of tragic part of the model and then how we tried to fix it. Uh, so one of the things we can do is just look at, um, am I going way over time? Am I gonna go over time? Okay, uh, <laughs> perfect. Um, I'll just talk faster, that seems like a good idea. Uh, so we can just look at straight up correlation. So at each point, uh, this is just a correlation across that almost 30 years of data. Uh, and what you can see is, and so terrible is yellow, good is blue. Um, what you can see is that the model does not do a good job of matching the satellite data uh, in, um, in these um, savanna type regions. Not surprisingly, it does really well in northeastern forests. We, even though people will tell you we need to study northeastern forest phenology more, I will tell you we're doing a much better job at that than we are anywhere else. Um, but uh, this is where I was talking about it's interesting to actually know how this actually actually works. So for all of that land area across this entire model, the way that it deals with phenology 
in these tropical regions, so where it's not too cold and not too, uh, you don't get really short days, uh, plants decide to start growing leaves. Uh, if the third soil layer, which is like five centimeters deep, uh, is wet for 15 days, then they start growing leaves. Once they've committed to starting growing leaves, they have to spend all of the carbon they have in their stored leaf pool uh, and spend it over the course of 30 days. That's how long it takes for everybody. Uh, and then they'll decide to start dropping leaves. Um, first, they have to complete that onset period, so they can't like start growing leaves and then be like, ah, no water, just kidding. Um, they have to go through the whole thing. Uh, and then they start dropping leaves if it's just the opposite. So the soil is too dry for 15 days. Uh, and the leaf drop period is fixed at 15 days. So this is really simple. Um, you might not be surprised that it doesn't work that well. It actually works surprisingly well in some systems. So one way we could look at it is just to say, OK, if we take all of the pixels with these different plant functional types, uh, how well do they match to what the satellite says? And if you look, so this is temperate C3 grasses, which is what the model was developed for. And lo and behold, it's not that bad. On average, like we have this weird like humpy situation. But uh, for a model, if you, like, if you produce this and that was it, you'd be like, I'm pretty psyched about how well my model works. Uh, it gets, it's getting the seasonality right for C4 grasses in the, that's Northern Hemisphere, NH. Um, something's up, but that's, we'll worry about that later. Uh, the issue that we were really concerned with was here, was in tropical deciduous trees, uh, it seems like uh, we're getting this, anom this weird green up situation uh, in the model, which is green. Oh, I just killed my, that's probably, everyone will be happy that I'm gonna stop using the pointer. Um, compared to the blue, which is the uh, satellite data. We have this offset. Uh, so what we did next was look at individual points. So these are just, this is one way of trying to look at data uh, really carefully is to pull apart, um, pull out individual points. And we also looked at daily data, which is rare. So uh, here we're looking at those three, those, sorry, those four points mapped. The black dots are the satellite data, so we only have that monthly. Um, for a particular year, I think this is 2000. The gray bars are the actual uh, the rainfall. Uh, and then we plot on top of that uh, the daily output from the model, which almost nobody ever records. Uh, and you can see this super weird green up situation in, so this is leaf area index in the model, green in, almost in all of these plots, you get this really weird bump of leaf on in the dry season. And we thought like, oh, that doesn't seem right. Something is definitely up there. Uh, and it turns out, after a lot of heartache and pondering, that the reason for that is that uh, soil moisture, that's what's shown in this blue line, uh, is really weird in the model. Essentially, it doesn't work in, excuse me, savanna type systems. Uh, and once the top of the soil gets really, really, really dry, water starts wicking up from an uh, infinite aquifer. Um, that's how the model works. Uh, and so it gets wet, even though it's really dry. So there's no rainfall. Um, we thought that was weird. So one thing you could say, like, oh, well, you cherry pick these four points. Uh, so we developed a little algorithm just to count the number of peaks in these situations. Um, so here, blue is one peak. The top part is the model. Uh, the top part is the satellite data. The bottom is the model. Orange is two peaks. And you can see, essentially, across uh, these savanna type systems, we're getting this two peak scenario in, uh, in the model. And most of the time, we only get one peak in in the satellite data. Uh, and so after a whole bunch of other stuff, we figured out that the best thing to do, at least to fix this problem, not to like fix soil water in the model, is to just add this rule that it actually has to rain in order for plants to start growing leaves. It was a miracle. We figured it out. Um, uh, and indeed, so this is now the new data. So this is the green dash line is um, running the same model, everything else is the same, but now plants can't start growing leaves until it actually rains. 20 millimeters over 10 days. Uh, and so it seems to work. It doesn't work perfectly. There are some places where it still doesn't work that well. Um, this is just all the data in case you like really like looking at really complicated graphs to see that indeed there were these humps in the dry season and now they're gone. Uh, and we can look globally and look at our correlations and say indeed uh, this, so now, so dark blue is good. So now we've done, actually I think I have boxes. <laughs> um, now especially in these savanna type systems, it's again still not perfect. It'd be great if somebody wanted to fund me to keep working on this. Um, but it works a lot better, which is reassuring. At least it's matching the satellite data much better. So the nagging question that I had with this project was like, OK, we solved this one problem. We solved it. We made this problem a little less terrible in the model. Uh, but 
In these systems, one of the most important components is fire. Uh, and so I was really concerned that we were going to probably, uh, that what we were working on was going to have an impact on the fire model. Uh, and so uh, that's actually fine. So I'm not going to go through this in too much detail except to say that this is the old fire model where essentially um, what you need to pay attention to this top right panel where the overall correlation between uh, uh, GFED 3, I think, which is this um, awesome fire data set and the model is 0.69, which isn't great, but it's better than a lot of other things in this model. Uh, but when we added this new component, which changed the soil moisture, uh, the performance of our model, so this is what it really looks like, uh, the performance of the model went down. Um, it went down relatively considerably. So this is the new model down here. Uh, this is just the old model, but compared to a newer fire data set and um, a bunch of other tweaks that were made to the model. So it gets worse by itself, and then uh, it gets even worse when we adjust, um, when we change the phenology, which isn't surprising because the like secret of climate models is that they are actually tuned to some degree. Uh, and so we had this fire model that was tuned to this extremely wrong uh, foliar carbon model or leaf area model. And so lo and behold, uh, it doesn't work that well. Um, or when we change one thing, we change everything. And that's really the big conclusion of this type of modeling exercise is you I really thought, I was like, we're going to fix this one problem. We're not going to mess anything up. It's going to just like tweak it a little bit and we'll make the model a little bit better. But uh, in a modeling system, what's interesting is the fact that everything affects everything else because that's how ecosystems actually work. But it also can be frustrating because every little tiny tweak you make can have these unintended consequences. Uh, and so just to look very briefly at uh, the fire data. So this is, um, it, we, I barely got into looking at this because it's even more complicated. Um, looking at the temporal patterns of fires, and so uh, this is kind of this is the old model, uh, and you can't even see the new model, but it affected pretty profoundly the carbon. I'm just going to click through all of these. So, uh, because we affected the fire cycle, we affected the carbon cycle, um, and so there are probably consequences to this. Um, the big conclusions were: uh, yes, we could tweak our model a little bit and make it look a little bit better, but um, but our change degraded our ability to predict fire, but there's lots more work to do in the fire space. Uh, and I'm curious going forward um, to see how this affects the bigger system. And what I'd really like to do is see what happens in a fully coupled run, uh, which this change was actually incorporated into the base of CLM so that we will find that out uh, at some point soon. Um, and the last, I think I'll just have this be my last slide, which is one of the things that I'm really excited about for this work is this new satellite, the Soil Moisture Active Passive Satellite. Now it's just the Soil Moisture Passive Satellite, but uh, we're actually going to be able to measure soil moisture globally, I think daily, um, uh, using this new satellite that just launched about a year ago. And so hopefully that will really help inform our understanding of phenology in these dry systems. Uh, and I'm just going to skip through a bunch of slides, ignore all that, and we'll go to uh, acknowledgements because you can all just glance at that for like 15 seconds um, uh, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> uh, questions? Thoughts? Comments? Yeah. Way back to the beginning. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So the model was not working well in those areas in both directions. Right. And your calibration changed. Yeah. So it was working well. And you talked a little bit about it had to do with land use. Some of the, those areas where it wasn't working well were land use. So I was trying to figure out, and part of it was that there just wasn't any new generation there. Why is there could you a change in both directions? why you might always overestimate how much vegetation could be there based on your model. Mm -hmm. But why sometimes you either badly over or underestimate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that that was, um, and I know I went through that really fast. The, uh, the model was probably estimating a kind of 
medium level of biomass, and what we were seeing in the residuals was some places where it was way lower than that because it was grassland, and some places where it was really hi much higher than that uh, because it was trees, if that makes sense. And so really what it is, it's this, basically it's these like flat areas that are uh, mostly grass, and then they have some mature trees sticking up in them. And I, my, my opinion is that those trees are randomly distributed. They're not uh, there due to any like micro topographic gradient. It's just like that's where a seed landed and that's where they ended up prior to, and they made it, they got big enough before we started plowing the fields. So does that make sense? So the model kind of had to fudge in that area and be like, well, it's kind of average. And then when we compared that to the real data, the real data was either higher or lower than the model, which is kind of average. So, but wouldn't the model, okay. did you hold any, when you're basically, when you're doing a pollination, mm -hmm. you're holding the data inside and basically are separating plain data and the model? I didn't in that study. I okay. should have in hindsight. Um, because maybe that's what I was trying to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it makes sense that you wouldn't do that. Yeah. Yeah, I, that, that's like the, that's the one study where I, um, I didn't do that. Actually, that's not true. I've done that. I've gotten away with not doing <laughs> that several times. Um, and mostly because in that study, I really wanted to use the entire yeah. data set. And I think because if I had pulled out like 10% of the data, it still would have been nested in this spatially yeah. contiguous environment. So it wouldn't have really been independent anyway. Yeah. We did a couple projects where we tried to compare, uh, like tried to build models at Jasper Ridge and then run them on a separate site that was a little further north. I don't remember what any of the results of that were because we never actually wrote them up. But that was a good question. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes. So it does not work in heavily vegetated environments. Um, so it works, I forget what the, um, where it stops working, but it basically there is noise created by vegetation. So it'll pr it should work reasonably well in savanna type systems, but it doesn't work in closed canopy forests. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a, a radiometer, I think, right? I'm looking at that. No, I mean, in the U.S., if you want to just work in the U.S., we have great uh, flux tower networks and um, those types of things. I think the SMAP, there is a validation team that's really trying to get uh, out to places that people don't often work because it only really works in dry systems, and so people don't often work in those. Um, but, uh, I mean, if you look at the distribution of any sort of long-term monitoring anything in Africa, there's basically very little. Um, and so for a lot of these products, they're really not well valid. In, uh, in the parts of the world that we really should have lots more real data. And hopefully that will change, but that is definitely the current state of things. One more? Uh, no, um, it's, su it's really complicated, especially if you're trying to predict what people are going to do, um, even just on really short time scales. I mean, anyone who's more than, uh, anyone who remembers the world before cell phones, right? Like, so, uh, <laughs> so the world is totally different than it was 20 years ago because we all have these gadgets in our pockets. Um, but, and so like, no, and no one could have predicted that. Like none of the, um, yeah, no one could have predicted that. Uh, I'm really interested, or I have a student right now who's interested in uh, wildlife. And so uh, wildlife and just uh, kind of animals in general. There's like, there's a very, very, very small community of people who are pushing to have 
uh, grazing animals incorporated into these models, um, both uh, ones that are managed by people and ones that aren't, um, both from a, paleo from a paleo perspective, it should be really important, like mammoths and stuff like that. Um, and certainly from a cattle ranching perspective and rewilding and all that stuff. Uh, so there's a very small community of people who are interested in that, and I think that's an interesting way to go. Um, but trying to figure out what people are doing and what they're going to do in 10 years is uh, incredibly difficult, especially in these systems where things are changing really fast. Right. Which is what yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. This idea that most landscapes we look at today are actually heavily impacted by people, even if we don't know that, uh, is a huge. You know, that means anything with remote sensing. We're just assuming. We're making huge assumptions about human lack of interaction with those landscapes, and so uh, I think all of that works super fascinating looking at. Uh, the massive impacts that people had historically that we just have very little documentation of now. Right, well, oh, cool. Yeah, thank you, everybody.